Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to our concert conversations with the Oregon Symphony this evening. I'm John Pittman, and I'm the music director of Portland's listener-supported All Classical 89.9. Any fans of the radio station with me tonight? A few. Any members? I want to know if they're supporters. You may be aware, if you've tuned in, you've heard a little bit more talk than usual. It's our spring membership drive, so we're hoping that if you haven't uh, signed up or renewed your membership, you'll do so soon. That's what keeps the classics on the air, including the kind of music that you'll be hearing tonight with the Oregon Symphony Orchestra, which is not here yet. But I do have the conductor, our guest conductor, Hanu Lintu, uh, returning to the stage. You've, uh, you've conducted with the Oregon Symphony before. Uh, yes, I think I've, I've been here before, yes. <laughs> actually, actually this, is the, um, this is the first orchestra I ever conducted in this country. I was, I was a very, very small boy then. <laughs> um, and I have fond memories, you know, since that. I've been here maybe half a dozen times. Maybe, I, I think this is yeah. probably six time, but now I haven't been here for four years. Yeah. I think this is the first concert I've had the chance to actually... Um, attend and, and do a talk with you, of course. Wow. Yeah. Well, there, you know, when I'm doing uh, things on the radio station, I like to do what I call connecting the dots. Last week, we did an Oregon Symphony preview of next season, and that uh, was a good chance for me to connect the dots in terms of choosing recordings featuring soloists who will be on next season and music that will be on next season. And Along the way, one of the pieces that I chose was Alban Gerhardt, who is our first ever artist in residence doing the Schumann Concerto. And I happily discovered that you were the conductor on that Hyperion recording with, with Alban. So it was, it was a great pleasure to be able to share that with our listeners on the air last week. Mm, yeah, that, that recording, well, that was actually many years ago. And, uh, yeah. um, Yes, uh, that was actually my first collaboration with Alban. We, we had never actually done any concerts before that. And um, we had a wonderful orchestra, the, the Berlin Radio uh, Symphony Orchestra. And, and the venue where we recorded this was a, a very distinguished church in Berlin, uh, in which Herbert von Karajan used to do his uh, best recordings. And, yeah, we had um, we have had wonderful time, and we we also had, well, um, well, we we were really fighting to learn all those pieces because there is also a Schumann concerto, but also three concertos by Schumann contemporaries, which no one knows about Gernsheim and you know the, the composers like that. But it's it's uh, it's 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 a very interesting CD because then you really understand why Schumann concerto is how it is because it, then then you hear the historical context of it. Yes, yes. And it's beautifully recorded, I, I want to say. Uh, so Alban's going to be back next year to do the Shostakovich Second Cello Concerto. And I'm actually trying to recall, are you coming back with us next year? It seems that you no. are. No, you're not. Okay. <laughs> so enjoy it while it lasts tonight. Um, but Benjamin Schmid uh, has been here before uh, playing William Bolcom's violin concerto, this time with the Saint-Saëns concerto. And he's another soloist, an Oregon Symphony soloist with whom you have uh, recorded. I came across Max Rager's violin concerto. Mm, so you, yeah. really, you really plumbed the depths of classical that music. Is, that is a monster. It's, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah um, my record company in Finland, Ondin, wanted to find something new um, to record uh, with, my, with my orchestra in Finland, which uh, have been recording lots of Finnish contemporary music and, and you know, even international contemporary music, and, and we wanted to find something. something. And uh, now we are doing, actually, a, a series of Enesco symphonies, and, and Reger um, was the other composer we wanted to concentrate on. Now, it, it actually has to be stopped because I'm changing orchestra. I'm, I'm taking the Finnish Radio Symphony Orchestra and leaving the Tampere Orchestra where we did this recording. But uh, yes, that 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 was. I mean, Reger Violin Concerto is well one of the longest violin concertos ever. It's it's probably 55 minutes, maybe. maybe well, depends on 
depends on tempos could mm. be even even 58 um it, it's it's a post brahms uh, it, it it almost could be a, a, a violin concerto composed by bruckner Although he, he didn't compose any concertos, but but it's it's um, it's a massive a, it, scale. That sounds like yeah. It's a, it's a it's a huge piece and a big orchestra. Um, I don't know if I would ever really perform it live, but recording it was was also um, quite an adventure. So uh, <laughs> I've been only doing adventurous recordings, but uh, yeah. But that was the first time I, I um, collaborated with with, with Benny and. Um, and now actually we have another project uh, which is on its way. Um, we just got the first masters a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have recorded Ligeti Violin Concerto uh, with the Finnish Radio Symphony Orchestra. And um, yeah, so, um, yeah, we have been working together quite a lot. So this is a little opportunity for you to reconnect with Mr. Schmid in, uh, in this Portland performance of the Saint-Saëns Concerto which, if one were to say, relatively speaking, to the Brahms, to the Tchaikovsky, to the Beethoven, doesn't appear on, on concert rosters quite as often, as Saint-Saëns' Saint third concerto. No. no. <laughs> why, why do you think that is? Um, what, what Are there deficiencies in the piece? Or? Well, I mean, there, there certainly are two dozen concertos which are bigger, yeah. uh, which, are, which, which might be more deep, which, which might have something more uh, profound, uh, least, yeah, profound things to tell, um, which, which, might, um, which might be more difficult for the soloist, because this one is difficult, but you know, sometimes soloists, they want to play the most difficult concerto, just to show that they can play the most difficult concerto. Um, and I mean, I mean, they, they have Brahms, they have Beethoven, they have Mendelssohn, they have Tchaikovsky, they have Berg, they have Sibelius, they have Bartok, they have Nielsen, they have. So I, I think, well, after after the pianists, they they have the most famous and the greatest uh, concertos ever written. Um, so uh, it it very easily happens that concertos like like Sessions or or, or or even even Elga or <laughs> Uh, Svensson, you know, is it, you know, um, the concertos which are which are very good, but are, are not played very often because there are so many greater, uh, bigger, more weight weightier uh, 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 concertos. This one is this one is a charming piece, really, really virtuoso violin concerto, um, but it doesn't provide a very um, interesting orchestral background. I mean, it, is it not as boring as an ordinary Paganini concerto, where the, where the violin just plays scales up and down and the orchestra once in a while says eh, and then just... Uh, <laughs> and so this, it's, this, this is not one of those. Uh, this, it's, it's, it's pro it provides a very, very beautiful um, uh, haunting background, uh, but it, it's still accompaniment. And also, uh, you know, it, it's... It's mainly uh, trying to provide a perfect background for a great violin solo. It's not like Brahms concerto or, or Alban Baer concerto, where you where you really have to it, um, you, you really have to carry the piece together with with, with the soloist. And when we're talking about a great violinist for whom this work was written. Uh, for Saint-Saëns, that would be Pablo de Sarasate, who was a very uh, uh, influential composer, uh, kind of... He, he was the Paganini of the latter part of the 19th century. He was extremely gifted, and he wrote some good pieces, too, I think. I mean, they're a little bit more lighter, they're lighter pieces, but they're well constructed. Um, and it's said that there's a lot of Sar what Sarasate could do uh, that had an in influence on Saint-Saëns in the writing of this concerto. <laughs> Is that a question? No, well, it's kind of a statement question. <laughs> yes, of course. I mean, yeah. Sarasate was one of those soloists, um, like, like probably Paganini and later Rostropovich and, and you know, uh, Joseph Menu, Menu in Joseph Joachim, who they they collaborated really closely with the with the composers. They they they, uh, they liked 
and they, they wanted to play. And, um, but of course, I mean, uh, you can always, I mean, when you listen to the Brahms concerto, you immediately realize what kind of a musician Josef Joachim was. And when you listen to concertos composed for Pablo de Sarasate, you, you realize immediately what kind of musician Pablo de Sarasate was. I mean, you, you, you'll hear tonight. You, I mean, I, basically you hear the character of Pablo de Sarasate. Well, the, listening to recordings, which is you know, often what I do for these talks, is to kind of reacquaint myself in, in depth with these pieces, is learning that the piece is not a shallow virtuoso showpiece like some might be. There's, it's not as deep as the Brahms, as you say, but it does have um, a lot of technical showy s passages, but it also has um, some quite lyrical moments. And when there's uh, uh, parts where writers might say that it had a Spanish influence, it's not it's not characteristic. I mean, we don't have castanets in the background or I anything mean, that like that. I mean, that is typically time when, when all composers had Spanish influence. Yeah. All the French composers had Spanish influence. They probably still have Spanish influence. Yeah. I mean, li li listen to, to Bizet, listen to Ravel, um, everyone. I mean, they have Spanish influence. I mean, half, uh, half I mean, like Ravel, who was almost half Spanish. Uh, it provided, um, I mean, of course, that was a time when Europe was interested, um, and I mean Europe, uh, Germany and France. <laughs> they were interested in other areas, you know, remote, strange areas like Spain and Hungary and, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, Finland even later. But, but you know, um, it, was, it was just the spirit of the time. You, you, you had to be interested in, in things like that because it, because people wanted to hear things like that. The same Haydn, Haydn went to London to compose his London symphony. He, he, he changed his style completely because he, the taste in London was completely different than it was in Vienna. And French composers, they composed for French taste, which demanded a little bit, you know, exotic flavor here and there. And Spain provided that exotic flavor. And Saint-Saëns, he, he loved to travel too. He liked to... Uh, go to other countries, went to North Africa later in his life. So I, I guess he particularly seemed uh, attracted to exotic locales or the notion of exotic That things. I don't know about. Yeah. Um, Saint-Saëns had a pretty interesting life. He was one of these prodigies, uh, like Mozart and Mendelssohn, but I think that nowadays we don't uh, think about that aspect of Saint-Saëns so much. Uh, by the time he died in 1921, he was seen as kind of an old-fashioned composer, uh, but that wasn't the he case. He was old-fashioned composer yeah. in 1921. <laughs> uh, Saint-Saëns was uh, a, a typically, um, I think he was related to Mozart, I mean <laughs> mentally related to Mozart and, and Mendelssohn more than uh, some other composers um, of um, uh, 19th and 18th century, um, because I, th I think he heard everything in his head and, and everything came out easily. Uh, um, very often I I've sense Mendelssohn-like uh, phrases, the Mendelssohn-like easiness, um, and of course the, 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 the Mendel Mendelssohn easiness comes from Mozart, so there is, there is a there is a certain connection to um, to this kind of uh, Rococo um, world of of, uh, of 18th century. Um, but he was, of course, a wonderful musician himself. Yes, obviously, um, he, he played his own concertos and and um, yeah, and 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 was obviously a very good teacher too. Let's talk about the Mussorgsky, which opens the Finally. concert. Finally, yes, I know. I'm sure you have. I, I always studied, almost studied wondering I, if I am Benjamin Schmid, but no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Mussorgsky Night on Bald Mountain is not the Night on Bald Mountain that you have been uh, accustomed to hearing. It's considerably different. This is the original 1867 version that Mussorgsky wrote, which was unknown to the world for decades and decades until maybe 1968 when the first 
public performance took place. Uh, and so we're getting to hear Mussorgsky as Mussorgsky intended, not on Bald Mountain, to be, to be heard. Well, the problem actually is that uh, Matthias Mussorgsky didn't intend anything. He, he, was, um, he was such a strange figure because he was, um, well, he was, you, you know his family background, right? He, he had aristocratic or at least yes, landowning. Yes, he was, he was part of the oldest nobility in Russia. His great, great, great grandfathers ruled Russia before, before the Tsars. Um, and, uh, well, you know, European aristocrats, you know, they, 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 when, when they degenerate, they start to behave strangely. And this actually happened to Mussorgsky. He, he, was, he was an alcoholic. He, he was, um, I don't know, I mean, modern psychiatrists would probably find many, many, many problems in his head. But um, he was immensely gifted composer. I would say he was a genius. Um, but he was, um, I mean, he was ahead of his time. He was, he was so modern that uh, the Russian composing school of that time, uh, 1960s, didn't provide enough tools for him to express all his revolutionary ideas. And also because he couldn't control his life. I mean, he, he didn't have home. He was, he was living with uh, Rimsky Korsakov, who was, who was his good friend uh, and, and uh, a fellow composer. Uh, and uh, Rimsky always tried to help Mussorgsky, who was always in need of help, a little bit like Beethoven, and that, uh, that people needed to take care of him. And um, <coughs> um, what he did was that he, he composed, well, he composed this piece in 1967, I suppose, and uh, all his friends were against it. I mean, they all came to him. They, Rimsky Korsakov, Mili Balakirev, all, 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 all his trusted friends, they, they took the score and they said, N -n look, Matthias, this is impossible. This, you, this, this can't be played. This is against all the possible rules of composing. Uh, the balance wise, this is impossible. The form doesn't work. Nothing works. And this went on, actually, uh, during all Mussorgsky's life. His music was not accepted because it was so modern. No one understood a single measure because that was not the way how to compose in, in um, uh, mid 19th century Russia. And first he composed, well, a tone poem, St. John's Night on, on, on a Bald Mountain. Then he tried to use the same music for a ballet, right? Uh, which one was it? Um. Sorochinsky, oh, no, Mlada, 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 Mlada right. uh, which was a very strange uh, a project in which Rimsky and some other composers were supposed to compose the same ballet. Of course, that doesn't work. And for the third time, he tried to use it in an, in an opera. Same music. And still, it was not performed. So it was never performed during his lifetime. Um, and and that, that, was, that was partly because because no one just took him seriously. The same, I mean, and he was so young when he composed He was 28 years old. He was 29 years old when he composed Boris Godunov, which is, which is one of the greatest operas ever written. He was 29. And, and the problem is that when he died, he was about 44 or so. What? When he, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, I thought you went he here. Died. No, yes, he yes, 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 uh, 44. And, and he left behind all these manuscripts uh, full of unorganized music that was too modern for people to understand. Fragments here and there, um, but interesting ideas. And then his friends thought that, you know, they could possibly help him. Rimsky composed Night on, on Bald Mountain Again, he composed it. It's not an arrangement. It's not an orchestration. It's a composition based 
on the original Musoski, uh, Musoski piece, which no one had heard before Rimsky did it in 1867. Thank you. No, 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 no. no. Uh, the original is 67. The original 67. Uh, more Rimsky, 80. Rimsky by th that time, 80. 80, 88. 80. Oh, oh, yeah, or something. Anyway, um, <coughs> what was the question, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what, 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 I mean, I mean it's, it's funny. You can look, imagine, all these people, they try to help Mussorgsky. Uh, Rimsky, by composing a piece, based on Mussorgsky's piece, and, and also orchestrating the complete Boris Godunov, orchestrating the complete Hovan Sheena. Ravel orchestrated the complete pictures at an exhibition. And actually, now, it took 150 years before people started to realize that, wow, this guy was really modern. And that's why we perform now the original version of um, St. John's Night on a Bold Mountain, because <coughs> it is not the same piece y y you have heard. It is, it, is, it is absolutely not the same piece, but it is so much modern, it is so much innovative, it is, it, it is so original, um, it, and it is so 